Over the past couple of years, I've had the great privilege of conversing with a handful of pro wrestlers, but none have come off more larger than life or more like the person you see on TV than Maxwell Jacob Friedman, MJF. For those unaware, MJF is a pro wrestling prodigy turned superstar who currently wrestles for All Elite Wrestling, where he's the current world champion at just the age of 26. The self-proclaimed fastest rising star in professional wrestling has held his end of the bargain to warrant that moniker. The previously mentioned AEW is currently the biggest competitor to the WWE since the 90s. MJF has made this promotion his own in just a matter of years, catching the attention of the entire wrestling world, the industry leader included. This has all led to Maxwell being the center of what he's dubbed the bidding war of 2024, which would see the two biggest wrestling promotions in the United States fight for the talents of the young performer. And a performer he is. In an era where professional wrestling has moved more towards a display of athleticism, at times leaving the storytelling as an afterthought, MJF has managed to forge a style of his own which is reminiscent of an old school wrestler who makes you believe while also being an elite level athlete once the bell rings. You'd be hard pressed to find a flaw within the scope of Friedman. But perhaps the most interesting thing is how little we truly know about one of the most popular professional wrestlers on the planet. What we do know about Max is that he loves professional wrestling and that he takes it very seriously. I had the pleasure of speaking to Max very briefly where he answered a few questions to better understand his perspective during certain moments in his career. But with that being said, this is still very much an outsider's perspective on Maxwell Jacob Friedman's approach to professional wrestling. One that I hope you enjoy. For a man who calls himself the devil, MJF has the support of a god. But that's the beauty in what this man does. I'm not sure he'd agree with me, but from the outside looking in, it appears to me that MJF approaches professional wrestling as an art form. For many who don't watch, that might sound like a silly statement. Pro wrestling is seen as the lowest form of entertainment. There's no possible way anyone can consider it an art form. It's only when you actually sit down and begin to dissect what these hybrids of athletes and performers do that you truly understand why someone would consider it more than just lowbrow entertainment. These men and women are the only people on the planet who perform in front of a live audience week in and week out while simulating an athletic competition with the added drama of a telenovela. Sure, it can sometimes be raunchy, which is why it gets the reputation that it does. But when done right, there's nothing better than professional wrestling. Look no further than the premier feuds that both major wrestling promotions in America have put on. AEW's in particular includes MJF, which brings me back to my original point. Maxwell approaches pro wrestling like an art form, from a viewer's perspective at least. In AEW, wrestlers get more creative freedom than they would in WWE, for better or for worse. This allows the truly creative minds to express themselves how they see fit. It's like an artist with an instrument or a painter with a canvas, except for a wrestler. Those tools are primarily a microphone and in-ring style. You can learn a lot about a wrestler when you hear them speak. What are their motives? How do they interact with the live audience? The same can be said about their actual wrestling style as well. Does this wrestler move a mile a minute, taking all kinds of risks that can pay off but equally come back to haunt them? Or do they approach a wrestling match at a slower pace? with outsmarting their opponent in mind. In the case of MJF, he does what he wants and excels on every level. The first time I ever heard of MJF was when he was announced for All In, the largest independent wrestling show in history, which was self-funded by the Young Bucks and Cody Rhodes. I watched a then 22-year-old Maxwell Jacob Friedman introduce himself on the YouTube series that the Young Bucks and Cody were doing in the lead up to that show. I recall my reaction upon seeing MJF for the first time as being impressed by his presence and promo ability. A promo is a monologue or dialogue used to establish or advance a storyline. The biggest stars that pro wrestling has ever produced all share one thing. They're charismatic, larger-than-life personalities who can hook you in in an instant with a promo. Above all, professional wrestling is a business of telling stories. 
And in order to get an audience to buy into these stories, you need compelling characters that can capture the hearts of the millions of fans around the world. Again, I was impressed with what I saw from MJF for the first time in that short YouTube video. But it's one thing to be able to sound good on a pre-recorded video, and another to excel in front of a rabid live audience. And it's when I first saw MJF perform in front of a live audience that I truly knew he was special. Every great wrestling story, or any story for that matter, needs a hero that the people can get behind. Someone who inspires and gives hope. But of course, for any hero to truly shine, they need their villainous counterpart. A heel, which simply means bad guy in pro wrestling terms, is essential for basic wrestling storytelling. Every great babyface, which means good guy in wrestling terms, needs a great heel. Hogan vs. Andre, Bret vs. Michaels, and Austin vs. McMahon are all examples of your classic good guy vs. bad guy dynamic in pro wrestling. It's nothing groundbreaking. Every story ever told at its core holds these fundamental values. But times have changed. With the rise of the internet and social media, more than ever are people allowed to keep in touch with whoever they'd like, and that includes professional wrestlers. It makes sense for anyone with a platform or varying degree of fame to be on social media. It's a way to stay in the limelight and to grow your following, which is why many celebrities, pro wrestlers included, are on social media. But wrestlers are unlike any other celebrities. It's understood that actors are just that, actors. We understand that Mark Hamill isn't really Luke Skywalker, he's just playing a character. But with wrestling, it's a different dynamic altogether. For decades, audiences were expected to buy into these wrestlers' personalities and not think about who they were once the cameras weren't rolling. Imagine my shock as a kid when I saw Kane, a wrestler who played a destructive monster who destroyed anyone in his path, being interviewed on TV to promote a video game. I couldn't fathom this monster acting like a normal human being, and that's because I was a kid before the internet dominated our everyday lives. These days, Wrestlers aren't afraid to break the immersion on social media. We see them post their everyday lives, and for the first time since the wrestling industry started, we see wrestlers being human. And then there's MJF. MJF is wrestling's number one bad guy. In a time where every heel is cheered by the audience, Max will go the extra mile to remind you that he's a despicable, untrustworthy, disrespectful human being. You can catch him anywhere outside of a wrestling show, and he'll still be the slimy wrestler you've seen on TV. There's multiple reasons why Maxwell Jacob Friedman stands out amongst every wrestler on the planet, and we'll get into those a bit later. But the one that has perhaps helped him stand out the most is his insistence on being the MJF we see on TV at all times. MJF himself will tell you, he's not playing a character, and I'm not here to dispute that statement. What I'm here to do is analyze the MJF that we do know, and that's the thing, we hardly know about MJF at all. In doing research for this project, I came across an old documentary on MJF made by Kenny Johnson. His documentary was very well made, but it left me with more questions than answers. Simply put, you never know when MJF is telling the truth or not, and that translates into the stories he tells in wrestling. I just said MJF is wrestling's number one bad guy. And yet, he's had moments where he's made an entire audience empathize with him. Sure, he can be the absolute worst, but what pushed him to be that way? Was it the ugly nature of other people who turned an angel into the devil? Because if so, then that poses the question, is MJF really the bad guy? Of course he is, but his character, for lack of a better term, has death, which is few and far between in American professional wrestling. If we're given a reason to feel bad for the bad guy, we start to doubt if they're really bad at all. That's the beauty of MJF's presentation. You certainly can feel bad for him, but then he goes and does something vile, and you're reminded that he's past the point of no return. At the end of the day, Max is human. He told us before on television about his struggles with bullying and depression as a teenager. In his very memorable feud this year with the infamous CM Punk, Max, for the very first time in his AEW career, showed a human side. Characters in wrestling are usually very one-dimensional for the most part. There are a few exceptions, of course, across multiple promotions around the world. But rarely do we see a person who is perceived as the bad guy openly cry on television as they recall their past trauma. 
MJF breaks the mold of your traditional wrestling villain. Sure, he's the bad guy, but he tends to remind us that us, the human race, pushed him to that point. The devil makes you sympathize for him. And that's just one of the many talents of Maxwell Jacob Friedman. MJF was a day one AEW talent. He was at the press conference when the company was founded in January 2019, and it was made clear that he would be a major player for the promotion early on. Max was highlighted at AEW's first ever show, Double or Nothing, multiple times throughout the night. First, he was in the final two of a battle royal to earn a spot in the match that would crown the first ever AEW World Champion, eventually being eliminated by Hangman Adam Page. This match took place on the pre-show, but Max would find himself appearing on the main show later that night, eviscerating other young talent on the microphone in a segment where the AEW World title was revealed. No disrespect to the other wrestlers in this segment, but MJF was head and shoulders above the rest here. He seemed comfortable on the mic, as if he had been doing this at the highest level for the past 10 years. I remember watching this show with a group of friends who were all very new to wrestling at the time, at least wrestling outside of WWE, and immediately everyone loved MJF. Which is ironic considering he was very clearly an egotistical, slimy, narcissistic prick but he was so good at it that you just couldn't help but love him. His wit and charisma ensured that he became a standout in AEW since the very beginning. You knew this man was a top level talent. He was a special talent, or in MJF's own words, a generational talent. They say the best villains are the ones you secretly love. And I must say that description fits MJF very well. Maxwell was brought in into AEW by former executive vice president of the company, Cody Rhodes. This led to them being on-screen companions, despite MJF being a heel and Cody Rhodes being a babyface. This made for a very strange yet interesting dynamic. MJF was even an ally to the elite during their feud with the inner circle in the early days of AEW Dynamite. But I think deep down we all knew that at some point, MJF would turn on Cody. And when that moment happened, it led to an excellent feud with a handful of memorable moments. This was Maxwell's first proper feud in AEW. Up to this point, he still hadn't had a pay-per-view match in AEW. He was on the pre-show on AEW's first ever show as mentioned earlier, but he had yet to wrestle on the main card of an AEW pay-per-view. And then it hit me. Max rarely wrestles. Sure, he's on TV a plenty, making sure his presence is always felt. But since AEW's inception, he's picked and choosed very carefully when he wants to fight. And if you look at where he's at now, it's hard to argue against this strategy. We truly found out just how menacing and evil MJF could be during the build to his first ever AEW pay-per-view match against Cody Rhodes. We saw Friedman make demands that Cody must meet in order for their bout to even take place. Cody had to promise to not set a single finger on MJF until the pay-per-view take 10 lashes from MJF in a very memorable segment, and lastly, he had to get past Wardlow, MJF's large imposing bodyguard in a steel cage match. Cody went through hell and back in order to have the privilege, yes, the privilege as MJF would want you to think, to face this man one on one. And then the match took place, being very competitive for the most part, until the very end where it seemed Cody would get the win Instead, MJF hit a knockout punch on Cody while wearing his infamous Dynamite Diamond Ring, unceremoniously winning the match. MJF's first pay-per-view match ended with him getting the win via cheating, and the world hated him for it. But of course, Max didn't care as it only furthered his momentum. For the next several months, MJF was as insufferable as ever before, and the worst part is, we all enjoyed watching him be that way. Another defining moment for Friedman came that very same year. Then again, 2020 was a very defining year for all of us. The COVID-19 pandemic changed all of our lives. Things were uncertain, and at times it seemed like the uncertainty would never end. But the one thing that I looked forward to every week during that time was AEW. Pro wrestling was perhaps the only entity that never stopped production throughout the pandemic. While every major sports league, TV show, movie set, and others alike paused all production, 
AEW and WWE continue to provide content for their respective fan bases without missing a beat. I won't ever be able to thank these men and women enough for continuing to provide us entertainment throughout such a difficult time, but what I can do is acknowledge their hard work and creativity that kept me sane during that time. It's hard to look back fondly on this period at all, which is no fault of the wrestlers or anyone else who helped produce these shows. It's just sure hard to go back and watch pro wrestling without an audience, or with hardly an audience, I should say. But I would be doing everyone a disservice if I just completely ignored that time frame. And in this case, MJF had a few defining moments during this time that require mentioning. After defeating Cody Rhodes at Revolution, MJF would face Jungle Boy Jack Perry at the next pay-per-view, Double or Nothing. This was a match between two of AEW pillars of the future, and it was a masterclass in professional wrestling between two of professional wrestling's brightest stars of the future. MJF came up victorious in this match, further adding to his momentum and his nauseating arrogance. There was really only one way for MJF to go from here. He was undefeated and now picking up wins against very credible opponents. So naturally, he went after the AEW World Championship, which at that time was held by Jon Moxley, who was in his first reign. Jon Moxley had won the AEW World title the same day MJF defeated Cody Rhodes in his first pay-per-view match for the promotion. It was almost fate that these two would meet for the top prize in AEW at some point, and that's exactly what happened. The match was set for AEW Summer Pay-Per-View All Out. During the build-up, MJF began a presidential-style campaign to be the new AEW World Champion. He spoke on podiums, set up in the ring, he wore a red tie, he gave false promises, the whole thing. MJF in his mind couldn't see himself losing this match against Jon Moxley for the AEW World title. He had every reason to believe that he was truly ready to become World Champion. Even then, he tried to handicap Jon Moxley in every way possible, and he eventually did get a huge advantage heading into the match. MJF made Moxley sign a contract saying he couldn't use his finisher, the Paradigm Shift, in this match. It was MJF's last attempt to ensure everything was set up in his favor. When the match finally took place, MJF and Moxley had a bloody encounter, which for the most part was even. In an unexpected twist of fate, however, it was Moxley who broke the rules during a referee distraction as he used his band finisher in this match to ultimately defeat MJF and retain his AEW world title. For the first time, MJF was outsmarted and for the first time, MJF was defeated. It's quite poetic that MJF's first loss in AEW came by his opponent breaking the rules. That's what MJF was known for, breaking the rules and always getting away with it. MJF couldn't have possibly imagined being outsmarted by anyone, but it happened and he knew he needed a change. After his loss to Moxley, MJF approached Chris Jericho-led group The Inner Circle in a bid to join them to help revitalize each other. Or at least that's what Max wanted us to think. MJF defeated Chris Jericho at the next pay-per-view, Full Gear, with the stipulation being that if he won, he would join The Inner Circle. I hate to be a skeptic, but I never bought that MJF was ever truly part of the inner circle. And Maxwell gave us no reason to trust him either after the Cody Rhodes incident. We did get some brilliant moments out of this chapter in MJF's career though. The highlight perhaps being the musical duet between Jericho and MJF, which was dubbed Le Denner Debonair. This would be a good time to point out just how talented MJF truly is. I previously mentioned just how little we know of Max's past. But one thing we do know thanks to MJF himself is that he was an All-State tenor too in high school in addition to being All-County for football in his senior year. This man just loves being on stage whether it's football, choir, or wrestling. MJF loves being the center of attention. Why? Because he excels at it. MJF's vocal performance of Frank Sinatra's Me and My Shadow earned him rave reviews, even earning him a spot on the New York Times Best Performances of 2020 list. If you haven't realized it by now, MJF is truly a one-of-a-kind talent. At such a young age, he thrives in show business to the point where you'd think he'd been doing this his whole life. But it's never a guarantee that someone can translate all that talent so effortlessly on the biggest stage. But Friedman isn't just someone, and that's what Chris Jericho quickly found out. MJF's plan was always to tear the inner circle apart from the inside. 
When MJF was found out by everyone in the group, he broke the emergency glass because a smart man always has a backup plan. MJF formed the pinnacle with tag team FTR, Sean Spears, and his longtime bodyguard, Wardlow. The group was a force to reckon with. The pinnacle and the inner circle feuded for the better part of 2021. We saw the two groups face off in a stadium stampede match at Double or Nothing 2021, which was the first wrestling pay-per-view to have full capacity since the start of the pandemic. We also saw them face off in a blood and guts match, the first in AEW history. We then saw MJF put Chris Jericho through the labors of Jericho, which was a grueling gauntlet style series for Jericho to go through in order to get one final match against MJF. At All Out 2021, one of the greatest pay-per-views in wrestling history, Chris Jericho would defeat MJF in a match where he put his in-ring career on the line. This would put an end to the near year-long feud between MJF and Chris Jericho, a feud which saw MJF have the upper hand throughout most of it, but falling just short at the final hurdle. Immediately after this, we saw MJF feud once again with one of his fellow future pillars of AEW. This time, it was Darby Allen. MJF really reached a new low during this feud, mocking Darby's personal family struggles, appearance, and in-ring style. MJF ridiculed Darby for being a spot monkey, which means someone who can't really wrestle and relies on high-risk moves, and even claimed he could beat him with a side headlock. We quickly learned that MJF severely doubted Darby's in-ring ability, as the match between these two at 2021's edition of Full Gear ended up being a brilliant professional wrestling match. Darby didn't have to rely on his usual high-risk maneuvers to stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with his fellow pillar. He proved MJF wrong in that regard, and he almost fell into MJF's trap of getting disqualified in the match. But Darby would ultimately fall short due once again to MJF's cheating, as he hit him with the dynamite diamond ring and pinned Darby with a side headlock. By this point, MJF had beaten all the wrestlers who alongside him were dubbed as future pillars of AEW. He stood head and shoulders above all his young counterparts. On the next Dynamite, while Max bragged about no one in the AEW locker room being on his level, he was interrupted by a ghost of his past. He met his match in CM Punk. To truly understand just how special the feud between CM Punk and MJF was, you'd have to understand just how much Punk meant to the younger wrestling generation. CM Punk was a renegade, a rebel. He played his music how he wanted to play it and no one was ever going to get him to change that. He inspired a movement in professional wrestling, which ultimately and indirectly led to the formation of AEW in 2019. MJF was a huge fan of punks growing up, even inspiring him to become a professional wrestler, though in rather unfortunate circumstances as we would later learn. The reason why this feud earned rave reviews was because of the themes of guilt, trauma, and triumph from real world experiences. Before we even got to that point of the feud though, we saw these two exchange words in a promo battle that many would call the best in company history. Both men are known for their promo skill, therefore we always knew if they were ever to cross paths, we'd see something special. On the night before Thanksgiving 2021, MJF and CM Punk sold a global audience on a future blockbuster match between the two in a segment that was just under 20 minutes. The really great part about this though, was the fact that this match was never supposed to be possible. Punk was gone for far too long and no one thought he'd ever come back, but when he did, this is the feud we all wanted. But as you should know by now, getting a match with MJF isn't easy. You must face the trials and tribulations that MJF sets before you in order to be deemed worthy to share the ring with him. So over the next couple of months, we saw MJF dodging CM Punk as much as he possibly could until running away was no longer an option. It was finally time for these two to face off, and so they did in an early 2022 episode of Dynamite in Punk's hometown of Chicago. The match was a methodical, outsmart your opponent type bout, which saw MJF once again be the vile human that he is. MJF first used a long piece of tape unbeknownst to the referee, to choke out Punk and claim a victory by knockout. Then the referee realized what Max had done and restarted the match. 
MJF once more got help from Wardlow when he passed him the Dynamite Diamond Ring and used it to knock out CM Punk once more for the win. MJF handed CM Punk his first loss in AEW, and you just knew he was going to rub it in. The rematch between Punk and MJF saw the feud reach its zenith. While the first bout was more about two generations clashing, the second bout saw the feud get very personal very quickly. CM Punk didn't just want any match the second time around, he wanted a match that would ensure Max couldn't run from him. The stipulation chosen by Punk was a dog collar match. But when choosing his stipulation, Punk mocked MJF for being a fan of his as a kid, bringing up the time Max met Punk at a meet and greet and added that for him, he was essentially just another fan. This ate Maxwell alive. Later on, MJF revealed the reason why this hurt him so much. He looked up to Punk more than anyone else. He wanted to be just like him. When Punk left professional wrestling in 2014, MJF felt betrayed and neglected by his hero. He revealed his struggles with being bullied and his bouts with depression and how Punk ultimately quitting wrestling made him want to become a professional wrestler out of spite for Punk. This was masterfully laid out by a man who audiences had previously never felt bad for before. We finally found out MJF's motives and why he's as bitter, angry, and hateful as he is today. Our hero in this story, Punk, turned an angel into the devil, and Punk's guilt is what added even more emotional layers to this story. This is proof of MJF approaching professional wrestling as an art form. This could have just been another match between the two where they could have hurled petty insults at each other like the first time, but they went far deeper than that. The heel was vulnerable and showed emotion, a cry for help. A lot of people could relate to how MJF was feeling at that time when he didn't even want to get out of bed. It made MJF leaving Punk a bloody pulp all the more dramatic as Punk tried to console him. This was truly the birth of the devil as we know him, and it was the hero who created him. The dog collar match between MJF and CM Punk at the 2022 edition of Revolution was a great way to cap off a feud with such emotional death. Punk dug deep into his old self to stand a chance against the young MJF, and it proved successful in the end. Perhaps the biggest moment in the match, however, was Wardlow choosing not to help MJF any longer and leaving the Dynamite Diamond Ring on the canvas as he walked away. This allowed Punk to grab the ring, use it to his advantage, and defeat Punk while also avenging anyone who had ever lost because of that ring in the process. After this, both men went their separate ways as MJF's focus became Wardlow. After taking abuse from Max over the past couple of years, Wardlow finally had enough of MJF. Once more, Wardlow had to overcome the obstacles set before by MJF to even get a match with him. MJF's main goal here was to neuter Wardlow's momentum in order for him to fail and not get the match. He took Wardlow's music, had him put in handcuffs, take 10 lashes which he easily shrugged off compared to Cody two years prior, and face Sean Spears in a steel cage match. As you can imagine, Wardlow passed all these trials with ease, and was set to face MJF at double or nothing. But something happened. Many names from WWE were joining AEW at a rapid pace, and if reports were to be believed, this made Maxwell unhappy as many others were being paid more than him. MJF rightfully saw himself as a valuable asset to AEW. He had been there since day one, and very quickly became a mainstay and highlight of the promotion. MJF would further add fuel to the fire by constantly reminding us that his contract expired at the dawn of 2024 and that he was to sign with the highest bidder. There was reported backstage tension between AEW President Tony Khan and MJF, and it all reached its boiling point on Double or Nothing weekend. Reports said that MJF no-showed a meet and greet, and that he was isolating himself from everyone. There was a genuine concern that Max would not make the pay-per-view for his match against Wardlow. Things were unclear up until a few hours before the show began. MJF did end up making the show in the end, as he and Wardlow would open the show. MJF was defeated with ease by Wardlow, 
taking 10 power bombs in the process, giving him his first clean loss in his AEW career. After the match, speculation about MJF's future was still running rampant. Max would be advertised for the Dynamite after Double or Nothing, their Los Angeles debut, which would prove to be a very pivotal show in AEW's history for multiple reasons. MJF would cut one of the most raw, uncut, and scathing promos in wrestling history as he aired his grievances in front of the world. Many people called it MJF's very own pipe bomb, but to put that label on it would discredit MJF's original work. MJF accused Tony Khan of having favorites, mostly wrestlers signed by WWE, and he demanded Tony on air to fire him. It was a defining moment for MJF, as many seemed to agree with him while for the first time in AEW's history, openly making Tony Khan the villain to the AEW audience. The show would abruptly cut to commercial with hardly any mention of it being made afterwards by AEW, while MJF's profile was pulled from the AEW website as well as his merchandise. In the age of the internet, no one knew what was happening or what was next for MJF, and it made things all the more intriguing. MJF went silent on social media for over three months after this incident. MJF stepping away from AEW also came at the worst possible time. AEW was experiencing one of the worst injury crises that a wrestling promotion has seen. For the majority of summer 2022, AEW was without CM Punk, Kenny Omega, Brian Danielson, Adam Cole, and MJF while losing Cody Rhodes to WWE earlier in the year. As a viewer, these were rough times. AEW was experiencing a down period for the first time in their history. The level of success and momentum that AEW had during their first two and a half years was unsustainable. They were going to have a downturn eventually. I just never expected it to happen a year after their best year. Then the later part of summer came around, and we started to see the bigger names return one by one. AEW felt like it was getting back to its best after a rough summer. As we approached All Out this year, I wondered if they'd be able to reach the heights they did one year prior. All Out 2021 is considered one of the best wrestling pay-per-views of all time. It was always going to be a difficult bar to reach. All I wanted was a good show, and it definitely could have been that. But after All Out, I feel like AEW was set further back than it was in the summer. All Out was the show where MJF made his long-anticipated return to AEW after nearly four months gone. The headline should have belonged to him after the show was over, but they didn't. As we all know, the post-show press conference ended in disarray and left AEW in a bad place as four of their champions were sent home due to a fight that broke out backstage. More than anything, I felt for MJF. This was his long-awaited return. He was sorely missed throughout the summer and yet hardly anyone was talking about him when the show was over. AEW was fighting an uphill battle immediately following All Out. It was going to take a monumental effort to right the ship. But thankfully, AEW had all the tools to do it. During MJF's return at All Out, it was revealed that his pay had been significantly raised and was also given a spot in the casino ladder match, which he won. MJF's return to Sympathy for the Devil by the Rolling Stones will always give me goosebumps in hindsight. This was a man who was finally given everything he ever wanted, and he wasn't ever looking back. Upon MJF's return, crowds wanted to cheer him. He was too big a star at this point, and way too beloved and missed. Despite his greatest efforts to get audiences to hate him, everyone still cheered. Jon Moxley became AEW World Champion for a third time at AEW Grand Slam with MJF looking on with his casino chip, which he could cash in at any given moment. MJF began an arc where he wanted to prove himself, truly prove himself without the use of any cheating or other outside forces. A stark contrast to where we were one year ago. 
MJF decided he was going to cash in his casino chip at full gear to face Jon Moxley for the AEW world title. This would be a match two years in the making. When MJF faced Moxley at All Out 2020, he was still a young, brash, egotistical, yet talented wrestler who just wasn't quite ready. But now, MJF had lost enough, hurt enough, cried enough to finally face what had been eating him alive for the past two years. MJF was feuding with the Blackpool Combat Club while also feuding with The Firm. William Regal was also constantly scolding a resentful MJF who despised Regal for turning him away from WWE many years ago. It all came to a head at the pay-per-view. Full Gear was exactly the type of show AEW needed to have after the disaster coming out of All Out two months prior. This was without a doubt one of my all-time favorite AEW pay-per-views. From top to bottom, everything felt like a grand reset of AEW, which was very much needed at this point. And what better way to start a reset by crowning a new world champion? MJF faced John Moxley in Newark, New Jersey that night and he had the entire audience behind him. Everyone was ready for it to happen. The twist that most saw coming, with William Regal giving MJF the brass knuckles to defeat Moxley, was still perfectly executed and it gave us the moment the night needed to be a perfect one. MJF defeated Jon Moxley to become AEW World Champion at just the age of 26, living up to the self-proclaimed label of fastest rising star in professional wrestling. Despite MJF saying in the buildup that he wanted to win the AEW world title the right way, I just couldn't have imagined his first world title win being anything other than the way it actually went. Here's the thing, MJF is a natural born villain. He was made for this role, which is why he embraces it and calls himself the devil. He thrives as the bad guy and he knows this, because every great story needs a great villain. MJF wouldn't be where he is today, AEW World Champion, if he hadn't embraced the role of professional wrestling's biggest villain, because frankly, no one does it better than him. Since full year, my interest and passion for AEW has been rejuvenated, and that's largely in part by MJF leading the charge during this much needed reset. It feels like a new era in all elite wrestling, as the company looks to end the year on a strong note after a roller coaster year. MJF's reign has only started, and we've already gotten off to a fantastic start with his first defense being against Ricky Starks. Starks has long been a wrestler whom fans have been clamoring to get a shot in the main event. Then there's the added possibility of MJF revisiting every single one of his past feuds, but only now he's world champion. Feuds with Wardlow, Jack Perry, Darby Allin, and one that I'm especially excited for, Hangman Page. It can be argued that Hangman is AEW's main protagonist. Meanwhile, MJF is without a doubt AEW's main antagonist since day one. When these two faced off in 2019, they weren't the people that they are now. They didn't have the amount of character development that they do now. MJF and Hangman Page are AEW's two most developed characters, and a feud for the world title would be a special sight to behold. Then you have guys like Adam Cole, Eddie Kingston, and Brian Danielson who can all make for world-class feuds with MJF for the world title. The sky is the limit here, and the future has never looked brighter for the AEW world title scene. And that begins with a champion that the audience care about. Despite MJF being such a dirtbag, we still care for him as an audience, and I know he knows it too. Maxwell Jacob Friedman's long journey to be crowned world champion has been a pleasure and a joy to follow. 
It's rare to see a villainous personality in wrestling stay true to that label at all times, while also being beloved by the audience. MJF is the perfect world champion to grow AEW's brand. He can make all the media appearances and entice you to check more of him out because of his larger than life personality. I'm not one of those fans who wishes that things be like they used to be. Things change, everything evolves. You become stagnant if you do too much of the same. The biggest compliment I can give to MJF is he unites fans who long for the old days and the fans of today's pro wrestling. He's the best of both worlds, and there's hardly anyone in the wrestling industry who does it as well as him. It's no wonder Hollywood has started to take notice of the devil himself. It was only a matter of time before studios came calling for the talents of MJF, as he has found his first gig in the film industry. MJF was recently cast in A24's The Iron Claw, a biopic on the Von Erich family. This is huge, and I can imagine it's the first of many roles we might see MJF in. The cold hard truth is, Maxwell is on borrowed time in the wrestling industry. His skills in front of the camera have now been noticed by filmmakers, and it'll only continue to snowball from here. This does however make MJF's value in wrestling all the more greater. Max has never shied away from telling us that he goes where the money is. If AEW and Tony Khan can continue to tie him down, then it's possible that AEW might have their first big mainstream star on their hands. On the other hand, you simply can't count out the possibility of WWE one day snagging him away. At the end of the day, it's a business, and MJF rightfully wants to get paid, which is why an alternative in the United States is so important. Wrestlers jumping from one company to another was what most people described as the best part of the Monday Night Wars. We're seeing it happen again, with many shock defections on both sides already happening. One can hope that AEW lasts as long as possible, and that it continues to be healthy so wrestlers can have choices and get paid what they deserve to get paid. MJF openly advocating for a bidding war will benefit wrestlers. This will only make the wrestling industry healthier in the long run as wrestlers will no longer have to settle for pay that is beneath their value. MJF is making sure he leaves professional wrestling in a better way than it was when he came into it. A common debate amongst wrestling fans today is why wrestling isn't as popular as it used to be. No one can ever agree to a single definitive answer, and maybe there lies the problem. Times have changed, yet the presentation of wrestling has largely stayed the same. The industry seems to have become stagnant. The funny thing is, professional wrestling is still a very lucrative industry. Now more than ever, TV networks are willing to shell out huge money for wrestling shows due to their relatively low cost production compared to your traditional TV series. This has made wrestling promotions far too comfortable at times. And the fear of wrestlers becoming too successful is still one that looms very large over the industry. It's a strange mentality to have. Realistically, you'd want your wrestlers to break the pop culture glass ceiling in order to bring more eyes to your show. Which leads me to my point. Despite MJF being so young, it appears he's on track to become a crossover star, so long as he keeps up the pace. Pro wrestling has not seen the heights it reached in past decades, but then again, we consumed media differently back then. Now, every TV show is competing with streaming services and social media for your attention. Things aren't as concentrated as they used to be. Nowadays, everyone can find whatever small niche they'd like and be a part of a smaller community with a feeling of belonging. Professional wrestling has also seen its popularity dwindle with the rise of the UFC. There's simply too much competition that might prevent wrestling from ever reaching those unbelievable heights of the 80s and 90s again. It's unfair to put that kind of pressure on MJF, 
but he's proven everyone wrong time and time again. MJF is thinking outside of the box to make himself different from everyone else today. He doesn't become one of the most successful wrestlers in the world if he doesn't insist on always being MJF. A new blueprint for a modern wrestling villain has been written and mastered by Max. And frankly, only he could have pulled it off. People are obsessed with catching MJF being different than what we see on TV, but I find myself content just letting the mystery be. Too often we dwell on the unknown and completely end up missing out on enjoying the moment. When that royalty-free entrance music hits, I know that I'm about to be transported into the unknown. Because that's what MJF is. He's the unknown in the sense that we hardly know a thing about him, and in the sense that we never know what he'll say or do next. That kind of unpredictability is something that's missing a lot in today's wrestling. Maxwell Jacob Friedman is a relic of the past. One that has already left a mark on the professional wrestling industry. Some find him to be too controversial for his own good, but controversy is what everyone loves, especially in wrestling. When MJF was gone in the summer of 2022, something was severely lacking on AEW TV, and to me, that was a premier storyline. After working on this project for an extensive period of time, it hit me. MJF is more often than not in the main or secondary story of the entire promotion, and that's the way it should be. Whether it was his feud with Cody, Moxley, Jericho, Darby, or Punk, he's always found a way to make his segment of the show the most story-driven part. That's the strength of Max. He can build any story with one single promo, and you'd be immediately invested because he makes you feel something. Whether that's anger, disgust, happiness, doesn't matter. He makes you have some sort of emotion that hooks you in, which make his matches feel important. MJF is also so unique that I always look forward to seeing how he'll interact with a new opponent each time. The way he acted and talked around Darby, for example, wasn't the same way he acted and talked around CM Punk. Around Darby, he was a bully and hardly paid him any mind. Around Punk, he trembled at the sight of him due to what Punk indirectly did to him. Character interactions was always one of my favorite parts of wrestling. Too often these days, it feels like a lot of wrestlers would be interchangeable, but not MJF. When he was gone, there was a void that no one else could fill. And that's one thing Tony Khan must realize when MJF's contract comes up. From hardly being paid with MLW to having his own custom Burberry World title with AEW, the progress MJF has made in such a short amount of time has been a joy to watch. Maybe joy isn't the right word, considering he fights with kids and curses dead relatives of wrestlers, but you get the point. One thing I'm sure of is MJF is about to go on a very long run with the AEW world title, which might lead straight into the bidding war of 2024. MJF has already told us this will be his reign of terror along the likes of Triple H in 2002 and JVL in 2004. The good thing is, AEW has a very deep roster which gives MJF multiple candidates to face as I mentioned just a bit earlier. What intrigues me the most though is MJF's contract situation. When MJF took time off after Double or Nothing 2022, no one knew what was truly going on. Wrestling journalists can hardly be called journalists at all. One thing was certain, MJF was unhappy and he wanted better pay. Two things you can't fault anyone for especially someone of the caliber of MJF. Max himself has said he went to Greece with his fiance to clear his mind during the time he was away from wrestling. Upon his return at All Out though, we did get one piece of information that is still being disputed to this day. The story being told by AEW is that MJF has had his salary significantly bumped up without signing an extension meaning he got a raise with his contract still expiring in 2024. Many have been skeptical with that news for multiple reasons. Contracts in wrestling work like contracts in any other sport or business. If you want a raise, you extend your time with the company. That's just simply how it works. We're being told that MJF got to keep his current contract length while seeing a significant bump in pay, which makes for some very interesting scenarios. If this were the case, what would stop anyone and everyone from demanding a pay raise from Tony Khan while keeping their current contract length? 
Sure, MJF isn't just anyone, he's your franchise player and pillar of the company. But I get the feeling this would cause discussions in the locker room, which would see wrestlers want more pay without committing to AEW for additional time. This also poses the question, would Tony Khan really trust MJF as world champion if he has yet to sign a contract extension? Because if MJF's contract is truly expiring when the clock strikes midnight for the 2024 new year and he's still AEW world champion, then that could leave Tony Khan in a bad position. As stated earlier, it's impossible to count out WWE in any scenario. During its first couple of years, AEW was the promotion of opportunities. They were the promotion by wrestlers for wrestlers. They were built off the back of discontent fans who wanted something different. Since then, both AEW and WWE have changed. WWE in particular has seen massive changes which have made them more appealing to certain wrestlers. Vince McMahon is no longer running the show at WWE with his son-in-law Triple H taking the reins and leading the company into a new era. Vince McMahon being the man in charge worked in AEW's favor. Vince was unpredictable and way past his prime. Triple H, however, received a rave reviews as Booker when he was running NXT during their golden era. And now he's running the whole show. Most fans of WWE have been happy with the change, saying things feel hopeful for the first time in a long time. And this can make WWE all the more enticing to wrestlers who are set to enter free agency soon. We've already seen former AEW Executive Vice President Cody Rhodes jump ship to WWE with amazing results in his favor. He went from being reviled in AEW to instantly being beloved in WWE, and he jumped when Vince was still in charge. I wouldn't fault any wrestler who considers a WWE offer. But one thing that will never change is the level of freedom wrestlers have in AEW. AEW can offer competitive money while also allowing wrestlers to follow other ventures without concern of being fired. Both sides have their pros and cons. One can argue if MJF will truly be allowed to be MJF if he were to make the jump one day. One thing is for sure, Maxwell Jacob Friedman will cause two promotions to go to war once his contract expires whether that's in 2024 or in some year's time. As this comes to a close, I'm reminded of why I love professional wrestling. The highs in wrestling are some of the best highs I've experienced in my life. That's just how much wrestling means to me. To be able to cover one of wrestling's biggest and brightest stars today made all those lows worth it. We've seen MJF grow in front of our very eyes from a raw talent with untapped potential to the leader of a company when they badly needed it most. We saw him meet his hero as a kid to wrestling that hero in a sold out arena. Though he can be unpleasant a majority of the time, one can say that the story of MJF is an inspirational one. Overcoming the obstacles he faced couldn't have been easy, but he did it. And now, every city he goes to, he has people chanting his name despite being AEW's main villain. MJF is a fascinating character in professional wrestling. He's very quickly building a legacy at a pace that will see him enter the upper echelon of wrestling royalty by the time he's done. And as stated before, he might be done sooner rather than later. At just the age of 26, MJF has the wrestling world in the palm of his hands and he's only just getting started. The devil has gained his own set of worshippers, as he likes to call them, by breaking the mold of what a wrestling character is supposed to be. We may never see anything like MJF again, and we don't have to. Because if Max wants, he'll be gracing our televisions for years to come. Whether that's solely as a wrestling personality will remain to be seen. But one thing is for sure. Maxwell Jacob Friedman is the fastest rising star in professional wrestling, and his star will only continue to burn brighter. The stories he tells, the emotional depth he displays, will always set him apart from everyone else. Because MJF is an artist, the wrestling ring is his canvas, and we're simply an audience to the art he creates.